All right, here, the scope of the sermon is, of this particular chapter is going to be in Luke chapter number 18. Let's look at, uh, we're going to read verses 10 through 14. We're going to, that's going to set the tone for the sermon this morning, and then we're going to go look at a couple other chapters. We will ultimately come back to this, but this is going to set the stage for the sermon itself. Look at verse number, we'll begin actually in verse number 9. So notice what it says in verse number 9, and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in, in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. So I want you to notice who typifies the man who is trusting in himself or thinks that he's righteous. It is the Pharisee, and then he says the other one is a publican. Now, a publican is someone that was working for the government. That's why he's referred to as a publican. And even today still, a lot of people that work for the government aren't that great of people, right? And at that time specifically, they would put certain people into, into this category. And it would be harlots, publicans, sinners, publicans, right? Speaking of them being someone that is obviously not a good person as far as their own deeds or their own works, right? The way that they live their lives would not be in a righteous manner. That's the point. So it says again, verse 10, verse, yeah, verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. So is he praying to God? Notice that. He stood there and he prayed thus with himself. So he's just, he's just like speaking to himself. How weird is that? He's just standing there just speaking to himself basically. He's not really even praying to God. Who is a Pharisee? It would be like the religious leaders, right? It would be like the person when you look at him like, man, that guy lives a good life. But notice this. He prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Yeah, notice, I've always, this always struck me as strange as well, and how he words this. He says, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. It's like, why would you thank God for that in the first place? That would be something that you would do. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, God wouldn't really have anything to do with the fact on how you live your life in that sense. You decide what you are and aren't going to do in life. But it's a weird statement to make. But it's just a way to just like bring all the glory back unto himself, right? I thank thee that I am not as other men are. Look at what he says next. So verse number, uh, verse number 12. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Verse 13. It says this. And the publican. So now here's the publican. And the publican... Standing afar off. So why is he standing afar off? It's because he's humble. It's because he, does, he probably doesn't even feel you know, uh, righteous enough to even come into the temple himself, right? So he's standing afar off. He's a humble man. Standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. Why? Because he doesn't feel worthy. That's why. So he doesn't even look up to heaven. He just bows his head. And this is, of course... You know, it, it, it nationally known, universally known as just a humble stance of just having your head bowed, right? That's why we do that. That's the whole reason why we do that when we pray. Is bow our hands because it's humble unto God. So he says, it, it says that he would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, breast saying, God, be merciful to me. A sinner. a sinner. Now notice what he says there. He says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Does he brag about all the great things that he's done? Does he bring up anything that he's done or he's performed or anything? Any good works that he's done? No, he, he, he looks, when he goes to pray, he looks to God and he says, I'm not good enough. I'm actually a sinner. I have nothing to offer you. I don't even deserve to be here. He stands so far off. He doesn't even lift up his head. And then he hits himself. He smotes on his breast, like beating himself, like, you know, just in, in, in almost self-pity and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Asking for mercy. What does it mean to obtain mercy? It means that you do not deserve something in the first place, right? He knows I'm a sinner and I, there's nothing that I deserve from God. There's nothing that I can earn or nothing that I can merit on my own, so please just give me mercy. Give me something that I don't deserve. I'm sorry, right? So he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Verse 14, it says, I tell you, this man went to his house justified. Speaking of the publican. This man went to his house justified rather than the other. So the publican 
is being found just. The, the publican is being found righteous in God's eyes. He is now made just or justified, he says, rather than the other. So the other man is not, right? You know, and, and the other man, he lists off all the good things that he's doing. And a lot of people that, that don't understand salvation, a lot of people that don't understand the gospel, they may look at a man that lives a life like that, and they think, they, you know, this person would be someone that believes that you have to be good to get to heaven, that it's based upon whether you've been baptized, whether you live a good life, whether you go to church, whether you read your Bible, right? The deeds that you do. They may look at a man like that, and they're like, man, he fasts twice a week. You know, he does all these great things for God, right? He prays to God. They would say, that's probably the guy that's going to go to heaven. But what they don't understand is that we're all sinners. Right. That everyone is a sinner. That the other God may have lived, you know, more of an openly wicked life. But, the, you know, the Bible talks about when Jesus exposes the hearts of those men that they're inwardly ravening wolves. That inwardly, they're, they're full of dead men's bones, right? So we're, we're all sinners. They're both sinners. But notice that the justification, justification is kind of ties in with last week's uh, morning sermon. The justification comes from God. It does not come from your own deeds. It does not come from the life that you live. It does not come from, you know, whether your, your own righteousness, whether you abide by God's commandments. The righteousness or the justification actually comes from whether or not you acknowledge, first off, that you're a sinner and then you ask. For God to, to give you mercy. For God to bestow upon you mercy. Something that you yourself do not deserve. Now look what it says again in verse 14. He says, beginning of, the, uh, at the, beginning of the verse again. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Now he tells you why. For, meaning because, everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So he tells you. Basically, we have an example of two men, one that gets saved and one that does not. This is, of course, a parable. So he's giving you an example of a man that just received justification by God and a man that, in a sense, was rejected when he sought justification, right? And we're told what is the main difference between the two men. And what was it? One man exalted himself, right? And the Bible says that he, by God, will be abased. The other man abased himself. And it says that he, by God, will be exalted. He was given righteousness. He was made just, right? So what is the difference? The difference is humility. The difference is humility and pride. The difference between being, being a proud man and being a humble man. The title of the sermon this morning is, is Humility and Repentance. Humility and Repentance. Now, first, I want to define for you quickly what repentance is. I want you to turn to the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter number three, Jonah chapter number three. Now, many people, you know, when they, when they, when they claim that they are preaching the gospel, they claim that they are telling people the way to get to heaven. They'll add in just this man-made phrase that is not found in the Bible ever. It's not found in the Bible one time. And that is repent of your sins. That phrase isn't in the Bible one time. The Bible never commands or tells a person to be saved by repenting of their sins. Now, the Bible does tell you to be saved by repenting. But the word repent does not mean turn from sin. Right. The word repent means to change your mind. That is what the word right. repent means. Now, in the Bible, the way to prove that without a shadow of a doubt is in the Bible. Do you know who repents more than anyone? And it's not even close to being a competition. Like it's like eighty percent of the times when someone is of the time when someone is repenting, it's the Lord, it's God who is doing the repenting. Now, does God have sin? Of course not. So, is God turning from sin? Is that what He's doing? No. What is He doing? He's changing His mind. This also debunks Calvinism. So, why would God be in this sense changing his mind? Because God interacts with human beings. And God gives man free will. He makes decisions. And based upon the decisions that man makes, God will change what he's going to do. So, God repenting, it's not God turning from sin. God does not have sin. It is God changing his mind. That is what the word repent means. It means to change your mind. Now, to just quickly, for you to debunk, you know, the, that you must repent of your sins to be saved... We're going to look here in Jonah, chapter number 3, verse number 10. First, I'm going to read to you Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 8 and 9. The Bible says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, 
and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And then it says this, not of works, lest any man should boast. So the Bible plainly teaches you're not saved by works. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And what, what is another word for the word repent in the Bible that's used interchangeably? And that would be to turn. So if we were saved by repenting of our sins or repenting of the evil things we do, that would, we would be saved by turning from our evil way, right? Well, I want you to notice that phrase here used in Jonah chapter number 3, verse number 10. It says this, and God saw their works. So God saw the works that they did. The Bible says that these are works, and then it's going to tell you what they are. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. So here we see someone repenting of sin. What did they do? They turned from their evil way. And what does God say that that is? That it's works, right? For a person to stop drinking alcohol, for a person to stop committing fornication, for a person to stop living in adultery, stop lying, stop stealing, whatever sin it may be, that's a work. To stop doing those things. It's a work to do good, and it's also a work, according to the Bible's definition, to stop doing that which is bad. It's hard work. Ask anyone that's tried to do it. Ask someone that's an alcoholic how hard it is to stop drinking. Now, should you drink? No. Should you lie? No. But do you have to do that to get to heaven? Do you have to stop lying? Do you have to stop drinking? Do you have to stop stealing? No. You're not saved by being a good person. You're not saved by abstaining from sin. You're saved by putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Matthew Amen. chapter number 21. Matthew chapter number 21. So notice again it said, And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. So repenting of their sins was works. And the Bible plainly says you're not saved by works. Not of works. It also says this, you can kill two birds with one stone if you ever turn to Jonah 3.10 to prove the definition of repentance. Right after that says this, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. So notice, God repented. Was God turning from sin? No. God changed his mind and he was no longer going to do the evil that he was going to do unto them. The word evil in the Bible means harm. God says, I make peace and I create evil. So evil is the opposite of peace. What is it? It's like war. It's something that is harmful. It's, it would be because he was going to destroy the city of Nineveh. And he repented of that. He changed his mind. He was no longer going to do that because they turned from their evil way. Now here in Matthew chapter number 21, in regards to the gospel, we get the definition of what you must repent from and what you must repent to. Again, repentance is just a change of mind when it comes to the gospel. Here in verse number 32, it says this, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. So he preached unto them the gospel, and they did not believe him. And it says this, But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, watch what it says, repented not afterward, that ye might believe him. So notice, it says that John came on in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed. And then, he, and then he says right after that, and ye, when ye had seen it, that the publicans and the harlots believed, he said, ye repented not afterward, that ye might believe. So what would have been the difference from when they heard John preach, they repented, and then what? They believe. So what was the repentance from and to? It was not believing to believing. That's why when, when Jesus Christ went preaching, he said, repent ye and believe the gospel. Who is he speaking to? People that do not believe the gospel. So he's saying, repent, change your mind, stop not believing, just like this group of people, and believe. Repent and believe the gospel. So the word repent has to be defined in its context because it just means to change, to change your mind. Is what it means. So in regards to the gospel, what do you have to do to be saved? You have to repent, stop not believing, and believe. You have to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one thing you have to do, and that's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you believe, you repent it. You know why? Because before you believed, you didn't believe. I mean, it seems simple, but you didn't believe, you repented, you changed, and now you believe. So at that moment, you believe, right? I want you to turn in your Bibles to... Uh, Luke chapter number 18, verse number 10. Now here in Matthew chapter number 21, verse number 32, you actually see this same theme again of the publicans and the harlots being coupled together. These would be those that you would look at and say, this is, it's just obvious that these people are sinners. 
It's very obvious that they live a sinful life. Again, it said, but the publicans and the harlots believed him. So notice this, this common thread throughout the Bible, and we're going to get into this, especially in the book of Luke, of the publicans and the harlots. The publicans and the harlots putting their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you are in uh, Luke chapter number 18, verse number 10, and we're going to walk through this real quick again. Luke chapter number 18, verse number 10. <clears throat> As I pointed out previously, the difference between these two men is one man is a proud man and one man is a humble man. Look at, look at verse number 10 again. It says this. <clears throat> two men went up in the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Now back up to verse 9 and he gives you the definition of these two men. Look at what it says in verse 9. And he spake this parable unto, unto certain. So he's speaking to these specific people. This is going to be for a specific type of person. Unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And then it says this, and despised others. So he's basically doing two things right here. Number one, he's telling you that the man that trusted himself, what does he think he is? He thinks he's righteous, right? Then he tells you that two men go up to the temple to pray. So one of these men is going to be the man that trusts in himself that he is righteous. What is the other man going to be? The exact opposite, right? A man that does not trust in himself and a man that understands that he's what? He's not righteous. That he doesn't, he, he understands that he is not a just man, right? So it says, and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee. That I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. I want you to skip down to verse number 18 now. I want to read this in context with that. That's why we read that again. Verse 18. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, if you compare this to Matthew chapter number 19, when he comes to him, it's... it's, it's, it's Almost structured in a cumbersome way to repeat. It's so redundant. He says, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So he just keeps wanting to use the word I. Someone that just always starts a sentence with I. Normally, what type of person is that? They're like a narcissistic type of person. They're a person that's very selfish. They're self-centered, right? And notice who comes to him right now as well. It's a ruler. We're told later that this is a rich young ruler. We're spoken of, he spoke of as having, having great riches. If you look at the world today, this is just a fact. If I were to ask all the soul winners in here right now, what are the most receptive areas that you go soul winning in? What areas are they? Like if you were to say, hey, tell me the most receptive area you've ever been to. Like you remember a specific day. It'd be a poor area, right? What is the least receptive area you ever went soul winning in? Chandler, Arizona is the least receptive. I knocked doors in Chandler, Arizona like, oh my gosh, it was a nightmare. If I didn't go soul winning on another day outside of Monday, I never got anybody saved. I had to go soul winning another day. Be, if I just went on my soul winning time, everybody knows that was my soul winning time, for two weeks, I wouldn't get anybody saved for two weeks. I mean, I, I, that soul winning time went like, m like three months sometimes. And everybody was a stinking Jew. Nobody was interested. It was like the worst combination. Most rich people are Jews, by the way. But, but everybody was super rich, and they weren't interested at all. At all. Why? Because rich people justify themselves. Rich people are what? They're proud most of the time. There are exceptions, of course. But the exception proves the rule is the reason why you know, we, can, we can identify that in the first place. Most of the time, rich people are very proud. And most of the time... Poor people are very humble. Those are the best places to go and give the gospel. They are so much more receptive. So you know who we have coming here is you have a, the rich young ruler. And what does he say immediately? He says, 
Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So who does he believe is going to inherit eternal life? Who does he believe is going to justify himself? Someone else or himself? He believes that he's going to be able to do something to inherit eternal life. It makes me think of the time in John when they come to him and they say, you know, what good work shall we do that we may work the work of God? And what does Jesus say? This is the work of God that he believe on him whom he had sent. Amen. So it's not, a, it's not a work as in a deed that, because you are not good, a deed that you can do to earn your own righteousness because you're not righteous. If it was left up to you, you'd die and go to hell. Right. If it was left up to you to justify yourself, you wouldn't make it. You are a sinner and you need someone to make you just. And that, of course, is God. So notice what he Amen. says here. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one, that is God. So what did he just tell this man? Is he able to do a good thing? He's not, is he? He's throwing him a hint there. Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, that's God. He's doing, he's, he has a dual application for this. Number one, he's trying to prove, hey, I'm God. Are you calling me good because you believe I'm God? That's what he's asking him, number one. And then number two, he's like, there's none good. After he just said, what good thing must I do that I may inherit eternal life? He's saying, you're not going to be able to do anything good. Now, I want you to notice how this just goes right over his head. Look at the very next statement. So he says, Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. And then if you compare this to another one, he says, What lack I yet? What, do I, what lack I yet? He says that, I believe, in Matthew 19. So he says, All these have I kept from my youth up. What does it mean to not bear false witness? To lie. Does, it, does anybody in this room, are they stupid enough to think that this guy never lied? Are you kidding me? So what is he? What is he doing? He's, just, he's lying right now, right? He's justifying himself. That was actually what I was going at, but he is lying. Yeah. He's justifying himself. Why did, why did he present the gospel unto this man? Because the, or the law unto this man immediately? He gives the commandments. What's he trying to show him? You're a sinner. Amen. If he's, you know, the law is a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Christ is standing there, and what is he trying to do? He's presenting the law to him to bring him to himself, right? right? To bring him to it. And then he says this, verse 21, he says, And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, Yet lackest thou one thing. So that didn't work. Now he's going to try one more thing. So you lack one thing. Sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Now, is that what we have to do? Do we have to just forsake our lives to, to be saved? No. no, we don't. We do not have to do that, right? But notice what happens. Jesus is again, he's trying to prove a point to this young man. He says, and come follow me. Now watch this, verse 23. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. Jesus knew that. That's why he brought this up to him. Verse 24. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. Now, if you compare this, go over real quick. We'll look at it. I want you to see it. This is the importance of, of studying your Bible. Go to Mark chapter number 10. Mark chapter number 10. This is where this parable is, or this story, it's not a parable. This story is told also in the other gospels. This would be Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic gospels. If you compare them, you can learn things. There'll be a little word there that's not in another one, and you can learn by comparing the two. So this story is told in the book of Mark in chapter number 10. That same phrase is found in verse number 24. I want you to notice a little difference here. It says that the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to, riches to enter into the kingdom of God? What's the difference there? Trust, exactly. So notice, what's the reason why he brought that up to him in the first place? Is because this man is trusting in his riches. This man needs to trust in Christ, and he's trying to show him, he's trying to demonstrate unto him, hey, you know, you need to trust in me is what you need to do. First, he tries to give him the law, and that, that doesn't work. He tries to show him the commandments, so he wants to point out something very specific about the law to him. A very obvious problem, we're going to get to this in just a few minutes, and that is what? Covetousness. That is, that he's a, he wants to show him that he's a sinner in the most obvious place. When I give the gospel to somebody, and I, and I quote to them Revelation 21, 8, do you know what I always point out? I don't know whether the guy murdered anybody or not. You know, I, I point out murder, but I say, how many people do you have to kill to be a murderer? 
One, right? I only point that out because the very next thing I ask them is, well, how many lies do you have to tell to be a liar? Do you know why? Because I know for a fact the person I'm talking to has lied. Because right. everyone's lied. Mm -hmm. Everyone has, right? right? This guy just tried to say, well, I've never lied. That's what he just tried to do. I've never lied. So then he looks at him, and he's a rich man. So what's going to be his biggest sin? The most obvious. He's, his riches. He's going to be a covetous person. So what does he do? He's like, okay. And go sell everything you have and then come follow me. Go everything you have, all your riches. You want to go to heaven? Go get rid of all of it. And then what's the first thing this guy thinks? He's like, man. And then he goes away sorrowful. So what, sh what should that have done for this guy? It should have caused him to understand, like, man, I got what's going on here? I, I got a problem. Well, I am a sinner. Yeah. I have broken God's law. I have broken the commandments. And then... You know, the clear question, what do I have to do to be saved? And then once he's brought, the, the, the schoolmaster works, then he's brought him to Christ, and he can give him, you know, the, the, the true answer. The Bible says that Jesus spoke in parables unto people that were blind, and, and they didn't want to see. He would speak in such a way so that they could not see. And what do we see here? He tried to give him, you know, the, the law, and if he would respond and said, hey, you know, I, I, I haven't kept those things, what should I do? What can I do? I am a sinner. Then, it could, then God could have justified this man. Just like you have the Pharisee and you have the man who was the publican who, was, who knew, you know, I'm a sinner. What could you do for the Pharisee? What was the problem why he couldn't repent? That's the title of the sermon, Humility and Repentance. Do you want to know the difference between the poor areas and the rich areas? Do you want to know the difference between the man that gets saved and the man that does not get saved. If the, the million dollar question, why do some people get saved and other people do not? Do you want me to tell you the answer 99.9% .9 of the time? Humility. What brings repentance is a humble heart. When you because you know what it all begins with? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what it all begins with. You have to first understand I'm a sinner. You have to first understand I need to be saved. I can't do it myself. I want you to turn to Luke chapter number 1. Luke chapter number 1. I want to show you a... I'm going to read to you from Psalm chapter number 18. I want to show you this common thread throughout the Bible. Uh, Psalm chapter number 18, verse number 27 says this. For thou wilt save the afflicted people, but wilt bring down high looks. So notice it contrasts the high looks, which would be what? The proud with the afflicted people. Who are the afflicted people? It's like the oppressed Right? It would be like the poor man or the poor woman. He says, Thou wilt save the afflicted people, speaking of the poor, right? Speaking of the humble, but wilt bring down the high looks. You're in Luke chapter number one. Like I said, we're going to be in Luke a lot because this is a common theme throughout the book of Luke. Uh, the common theme is humility bringing repentance. Humility versus pride. Self righteousness. Uh, as in trusting your own righteousness versus trusting in God's righteousness. Look at Luke chapter 1, verse number 51. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. It says this, he hath put down the mighty from their seats, and then it says, and exalted them of low degree. So who does he exalt? Those that are of low degree. Those that abase themselves, that is who he exalts. That is who are the ones that God exalts. That's who he justifies. That's who he gives righteousness unto. Look at verse 53. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich hath, and the rich he hath sent empty away. I want you to turn to, uh, I want you to go to Matthew chapter number 9. Matthew chapter number 9. Matthew chapter number 9. <clears throat> Matthew chapter number 9, when you look at verse number 10. <clears throat> Matthew chapter number 9, verse number 10, it says, And it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house, the old many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and, the, and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? Now, what type of attitude is that? Remember what it said in, in Luke? It said, this, He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves, and then what did they do? They despised others. So the man that's trusting himself, is he a sinner? He is, isn't he? He is a sinner. Is the person he's despising a sinner? They're both sinners. One may, may have sinned more than the other, and one might be a worse sinner than the other, 
but they both equally qualify just the same. There, there isn't this argument on whether they one maybe is a sinner or one maybe isn't. They're both very much a sinner. Right? right? So notice what he says. Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? So what are they doing? They're despising others. But what are they doing at the same time while they're despising others? They're trusting in themselves, aren't they? Do you understand what's going on here? The whole reason why they're saying he's a sinner and they're looking down on him is because they've lifted themselves up. They're, 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 real, they're looking, we're not on the same level is what they're saying. So they're trusting in themselves. A person that trusts themselves at the same moment despises others. So he's saying, why do you eat your master with publicans and sinners? Look at the answer of verse 12. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. I want you to notice this. He speaks in parables also right here. This is what I want to focus on here for a few minutes. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice for, because, watch this, for I am, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now notice what he says to them. I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And he makes the statement right before that. He says in verse number 12, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Now the discussion is about who? The Pharisees and who? The publicans. Who in this case would be the one that's sick? Who would it be? It would be the publican. And who would be the one that is whole? The Pharisee. Now, in reality, is this guy whole? No. That's why Jesus says to him, he tells him, but go ye and learn what that meaneth, and I will have mercy. I want, I want to compare this passage actually to where this comes up in the book of Luke as well. Go to Luke chapter number 7. Go to Luke chapter number 7. Now, here's the thing. It said, he, Jesus says, just think of it from, just from basic logic. He said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Are there certain people which are righteous in their own merit? Like, in the sense that they, they can be righteous, they can keep all of God's commandments? No one can, right? No one's righteous. So who did he really, who did he really you know, come in the sense of to give salvation to? To all, right? Because... There's really, everyone's a sinner. So there really isn't this category, if you try to interpret that verse, as those that are able to keep the law and be righteous, and then those that are sinners. You couldn't interpret it that way in the first place. And who is he speaking to? So keep that in mind also. He's speaking to Pharisees, which what? Think that they're righteous. So he's saying, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, okay? Look in Luke chapter number 7, where this comes up as well. We get some more details. Actually, you know what? This may not be Luke 7. It's Luke 5. Go, go back to Luke 5. So we're going to go to Luke 7 in just a moment. Look at Luke 5. Luke chapter number 5, look at verse number 27. It says this. And after these things, he went forth and saw a publican named Levi. So this is Matthew. If you compare this to the book of Matthew. His name is Levi and Matthew both. Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. And he left all and rose up and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them. Now, so comparing this under the book of Matthew there, we can see that whose house he's specifically sitting in is Levi or Matthew's house, right? And then also what we can see from this are, is that the, the people that came, they are Matthew's friends. So Matthew makes a feast after he starts following Jesus. So this is one of Jesus' disciples that he's in his house. And then Matthew invites all of his friends to come, and those are who would be termed as the publicans and the sinners, right? Look at what it says. So it says in uh, verse 29, let's finish reading that. Levi made, it, made him a great feast in his own house, and there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them. Verse 30, but their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, why do ye eat? and drink with publicans and sinners. So here we see them trusting themselves and despising others. Verse 31, And Jesus answering said to them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Keep your hand here and turn over to Luke chapter number 7. Luke chapter number 7. Luke chapter number 7, I want you to look at verse number 36. We'll see this common theme here. It's a theme all throughout, especially the book of Luke. It says in verse 36, Luke 7, 36, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. 
And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his tears, wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head. So what is she doing here? She's showing great humility, isn't she? She's washing the Lord's feet with the hairs of her head. She's literally bowing on the ground. I'm sure she's getting dirt all over herself, and she's washing his feet with the hairs of her head, right? Isn't this very similar to the situation that we saw with the man that goes up to the temple, the two men that go up to the temple? You see the great humility of one man, and then you see what? The pride of the other. Keep reading. It says in verse 39, Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself. Does that sound familiar as well? Remember how that man prayed. It says he prayed within himself. Right? Spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him. For she is a sinner. What's he doing again? Just exactly. He's, he's, despise, he's trusting in himself, and then he's despising others. Is he a sinner? This man? This man is. Everyone's a sinner, right? But he looks at this woman, and she's like, he, and he looks at this woman, and he says, Man, this woman is, is wicked. He's just, just, just overly, this woman is a horrible person, right? He just looks down upon her and despises her, right? Now, in the parable, who was just and who wasn't? The man who was humble was the man who ended up being justified, right? Keep reading, verse 40. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. Now, what's interesting about this is why does, does Jesus tell him this parable? It's because... God, because Jesus Christ is God. He is the Lord, and he knew the thought that he, this man just had in his house, in his mind. I want you to, to, to notice the phrase that he said, too. I forgot to point this out, so I want to back up for a minute. It's, the, the man says this, this man, if he were a prophet, is this, does this guy believe in Jesus Christ? No. He doesn't. So what is he saying? He's saying this guy's not even a prophet. Not only does he not believe that he's God, he doesn't even believe that he's a prophet. He doesn't even believe that this guy is, that Jesus is a prophet. So is this guy saved? Not a chance. So he doesn't even believe that Jesus is a prophet. So why would he have invited Jesus in the first place? Just because Jesus' fame, it says, was spread abroad. I'm sure that that's why. Just because it's like, hey, let me invite him. Everybody knows Jesus. Let me invite Jesus in, right? And then Jesus, because he knows the thoughts of his heart, he answers him. It says, look at verse 40, what it says, and Jesus answering said unto him. Did Simon speak? No. So what's he answering? He's answering his, the thoughts that he had in his mind. And Jesus answering said unto him. Answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, now what's the hypocrisy? Master, say all. What a hypocrite. Does he believe that he's even a prophet? No. So you see the hypocrisy here. Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. Does this sound familiar? This is exactly the same as, as the two men that go up to the temple. I want you to pay attention. I wanted you to remind you of that. Now, now watch this. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell them, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Verse 47, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. And then it says this, For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Now watch this, And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. So notice, the humility was what brought her unto repentance, it brought her unto salvation. And it says, he says to, to this woman, Thy sins are forgiven. Verse 49, watch this, And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves. This would be all the Pharisees, right? Who is this that forgiveth sins also? So they believe that God can, that Jesus can forgive sins? Again, these people do not believe that Jesus is God. 
Verse 50, and he said to the woman, thy faith hath saved thee. I want you to go back to Luke chapter number 5, verse number 30. And I want you to get in one hand there in Luke chapter number 5, verse number 30. I want you to get in your other hand Luke chapter number 15 in your right hand. Luke chapter number 15. We'll look at this other parable. I want to explain this other this parable to you here. And this is, I believe, a very misunderstood parable, very often misunderstood parable. <clears throat> there in, uh, in Luke chapter number 5, what we read previous, is where Jesus makes that statement, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. He says, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, when he says righteous there, it's those that are self-righteous. It's those that think that they're righteous. It's those that are trusting in their own righteousness. He says, but I came to call sinners to repentance. Right? Well, that's everyone. Everyone is a sinner, right? Every single person is, is you know, those that are offered salvation. But here when it says, I came to call those specific people, I'm going to explain that to you by looking at Luke chapter number 15, verse number 1. Luke chapter number 15, verse number 1, it says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Now, notice that. Notice who it, who it specifically tells you drew near was the publicans and the sinners for to hear him. Now look at verse 2. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. So you see this common theme? Now keep reading. He told you that for a reason. Look at verse 3. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? Verse 5. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. Now here's the key in verse number 7. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Now, a lot of people have misunderstood this verse by interpreting it that God, that all the rejoicing in heaven is over the one person that repented and got saved. And then that the 99 just persons that need no repentance, that those people are actually a group of people that are already saved. But that's not the case of what this is speaking about. The 99 just persons that need no repentance Everyone needs repentance. Right. The 99 just persons that need no repentance is the man that says he himself doesn't need repentance. The man that justifies himself. So the one that he finds is what? Who did Jesus say that he was sent to? He was sent unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When he shows up to Israel, who does he go preach? He preaches to all of Israel, but specifically, who are those that end up getting saved? Those that realize that they're a sinner. What is it that brings someone into repentance? It's humility. Now I want to keep reading the, these uh, other parables. And I want to explain the last parable, which is the parable of the prodigal son as well. <clears throat> so keep that interpretation in mind. That the 99 just person that need no repentance, that is the group of the Pharisees. That is the group of the scribes. That they look at themselves and they feel when they, when they look at themselves that they need no repentance. But the sinner is the man that realizes that he's a sinner. And he's the man that repents. Does he repent of his evil deeds? No, both groups are sinners. Right? right? He repents, and he puts his faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So I want you to keep that in mind, that both groups are of what nation? Israel. Israel, okay? Keep reading. Verse 8. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle, and sweep the house, and seek diligently... Till she find it. Verse 9. And when she had found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I have lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of angels over one sinner that repented. And speaking, of course, the publicans, the harlots, all those that get saved. Now look at this. And he said, A certain man had two sons. You see, you keep seeing this pattern. A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divideth unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. 
and there wasted his substance with riotous living. What does this person sound like? Sounds like the sinner, doesn't he? He sounds like the publican. He sounds like the harlot. Who does he sound like? He sounds like that group of people that the Pharisees and the scribes were looking down upon and were despising. It says in verse 14, And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a city of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And when Fain had filled his belly with the husk that the, that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to his, himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. And will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Look at this. And am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. What type of attitude is that? It's a very humble attitude, isn't it? It's, a, it's an attitude of humility. And what does he realize? Man, I am just filthy. Yeah. I, and notice what it represents. He's literally laying in a pig pen. So what type of state is this man in that actually gets saved? He's in a filthy, disgusting state, isn't he? What is he? He's a sinner. That's what that represents. Keep reading. And notice how he gets saved, too. Let me pause and stop that, too. What does he do? It says that he comes to himself. And he gets saved. Does he, is it that he specifically changes his life? No. Verse 18. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. What does he do? He calls upon the name of the Lord. He asks him to save him, if you will. Look at verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. You see the humility here of this man? See how he's a very humble man? He said, I'm not worthy to be called thy son. What's he saying? I'm not worthy to go to heaven. I'm not worthy to earn heaven on my own, right? Look at verse number 22. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put him on it. Put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. It says he was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Verse 25. Now his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. It says this, And he was angry, and would not go in. Therefore came his father out, and entreated him. Now, who do you think, just by the context, just by what we've seen so far, that the, anger, that the elder brother represents now? Jews. He represents the Jews. He represents the Pharisee. Right? Keep reading. And he answered, saying to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgress I at any time thy commandment. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Not a chance. Neither transgress I at any time thy commandment. What does the Pharisee say when he goes up to pray? He says he justifies himself. He says, I, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, like this publican. Right? And then he goes on and just talk about all of it. What does the rich young ruler say? He's like, you know, what lack I yet? All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? What does this man say? He says, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. What does Jesus say that many are going to say to him in the last days? What are they going to say? Going to say it says, Many shall say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works. And he says, and then shall I profess unto them, I never knew you. What are they trusting in? Their own works. They're trusting in their own deeds. They're trusting in the things that they have done. Are they justifying God? No, they're justifying themselves. Right? Look at, look at what this man says again. Neither transgressed I at any time by commandment. What is he not doing? He's not admitting he's a sinner. He's not humbling himself. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, watch this, which hath devoured thy living with harlots. Notice how it keeps t 
tying this man back in with the publicans, with the harlots, with the what? With the sinners. Those that are looked down upon as being the sinner. Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was me that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and again, and was lost and is found. Why don't you flip over to Luke chapter number 16. Luke chapter number 16. Look at the very next chapter. There's a particular verse. I got it written down here somewhere. Luke 16, look at verse 14. It says in verse 14, and the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things. That's the parables that he was just telling, what we, what they, what we just read. Heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men, he says, is abomination in the sight of God. So what was that parable actually about? What was the parable of the sheep? You know who the sheep actually represent? They represent the whole house of Israel. And you know who that lost sheep actually represented? It represented the publicans and the harlots and the sinners. And they were lost, and God went and found them. Jesus went and found them. Do you know what those two, do you know what the two sons actually represented? The father represented God, and the two sons just represented Israel. Right? Both of them. The one son was the lost son. He went away. He was gone, just like the sheep. Right? And you know what he was? He was the publican. He was the harlot. He was the sinner. You know what the difference between the two sons were? Humility. Do you know what the difference between the two men that went up to the temple to pray? One man was humble and one man was proud. Do you know the difference between those that get saved in the parable in Luke 16? The two men that go up to the temple to pray? Do you know what the deciding factor always of salvation is? Humility and repentance. You know what caused a person to actually change their mind and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? They first have to understand, I'm a sinner. They first have to get it. What do you do when you're getting ready to give the gospel to somebody? They turn you to Luke chapter, or Romans chapter, you better make one of Luke. Romans chapter number 3, verse number 10. Romans chapter number 3, verse number 23. For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. When you give the gospel to somebody, almost every time when they do not get saved, what is it? What's the reason why? It's really rare, but it's because of pride. It's because, you know the reason why most people don't even want to listen to you is because of pride, number one. But you know the reason why when you get through the gospel and at the end, that person decides not to pray, that person decides not to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior? It's because of pride. Do you know what the deciding factor between the saved and the unsaved is? As far as their heart, if we were to talk about an external source, of course it's because of the Bible. You know, they'll, you know, the external source, they have to, that's what humbles them in the first place. What do they have to do? They have to believe. But what is the deciding factor in the people that get saved and the people that don't? It's humility. It's pride and humility. Those that get saved, they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because they're, they humble themselves. They yeah, they believed on him that justifies the ungodly, right? Even, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but even in Romans chapter number 10, verse number 9 and 10, where it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, do you know what it means to confess something? It means like you're admitting something. That's what the word, there's a difference between profess and confess, right? You know, you believe in your heart, and then it says, and confession is made unto salvation. The confessing is you're confessing the Lord Jesus Christ because you're a sinner. You're confessing his name because you're a sinner. That's what the word confess means. Confess, by definition, does not mean just to speak something. It means you're admitting something. That's what you're doing. So that in Romans chapter number 10, that confession that's being spoken of is a confession of Jesus' name for your salvation because you're a sinner. That's what it is. I want you to go to Isaiah Chapter number 46, and we're going to end here. Isaiah chapter number 46. John 9, 39 says this. Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say... We see, therefore your sin remaineth. I want to point out to you, you may have never noticed this. 
how they actually miss, because of their self-righteousness, they can't even understand his parable. He says this in verse number 39, John 9, 39. Jesus said, for judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see. The ones that see not are the sinners, they're the publicans. They admit they're a sinner. They, they realize, I'm blind. And, and so he says, I've come so that those that see not might see, and that they which see, that's the Pharisees. They think they see, but they really don't. They just don't admit that they're a sinner. It's that they that see might be made blind. Now listen who they think they are out of the two groups. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? It's like, what is wrong with you? No, you're the guy that sees, but you don't really see. You think you see, but you don't, my friend. Do you see like the extreme level of, of just like self-righteousness, of trusting in themselves, of just thinking that, man, I am a great guy. Are you saying that I'm blind? No. You know, it's, it, it's, it's crazy. And this is how people will get though. You know, I want you to look at Isaiah 46. We're going to end there. Isaiah chapter 46. Look at verse number 12. <clears throat> it's crazy the level of pride that someone, that someone can get themselves to. Look at Isaiah 46 verse 12. Hearken unto me, ye stout-hearted that are far from righteousness. Now look at verse 13. I bring near my righteousness. People say, oh, salvation is different in the Old Testament. No, righteousness was God's righteousness then too. When someone was made right, when someone was righteous in the Old Testament, they weren't righteous because they kept the law. They weren't righteous because they came, you know, they, they kept the commandments. Right. They were righteous because they were given God's righteousness. Amen. So he says here, hearken unto me, ye stout-hearted, ye proud, you're prideful, that are far from righteousness. Why are they far from righteousness? Because of their pride. Because of the because they're proud. And then he says, I bring near my righteousness. I bring near my righteousness, he says, it shall not be far off, and my salvation shall not tarry. Notice whose salvation it is. He says, my salvation shall not tarry. It's his salvation. My salvation shall not tarry. I will place salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. Now, an application unto, you know, those that are saved. The publicans and the harlots. No, I'm just kidding. Those that are saved is this. You can get to the same. Repentance, you know, I, I heard everyone, most of the people here that are sitting here are going to know who this is about. I heard a great man of God say this one time. He said, you don't have to be saved to repent. You don't have to be unsaved to repent. And that's a true statement because it's not just a repentance of sin. Repenting is just changing your mind. And even after you're saved and you repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you still need to repent. You need to repent of sins in your life now. Not to be saved. But you need to start getting your life right with God. And you know the reason why you won't repent? Because of pride. The same reason why a person wouldn't repent and turn and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If there's a, a reason why someone will not get something right in their life, it's because of pride every time. If there's a reason why someone does not get saved, they don't want to hear the gospel, it's because of their pride. That's why. You know the people that want to hear the gospel? The humble. You know the people? Jesus said the poor have the gospel preached unto them. I don't know if you understand this or know this or not, but when Jesus was going around, you know where Jesus was soul winning? He was soul winning in the ghettos. He was soul winning in the slums. He was soul winning in the, you know, the, you know in the poor areas. He said the poor have the gospel preached in him. He went to every town, but you know where he focused the majority of the time? He spent most of his time in the ghettos. That's where he did. He went into the other areas, the rich areas, probably Capernaum and all those people were probably to do well, and they rejected him, so he left immediately. You know where he went back? The poor areas. Do you know where our church is going to spend the majority of the time soul winning? The poor areas. Amen. Because that's where people are going to get saved. And why? Because they're humble. You know, if, if you've never been soul winning, you don't know much about it, go try to knock on some of the doors here in Mandarin. You know, I'm not saying we're not going to knock these doors. That's still important too. But our main focus will be in the poor areas. Our main focus will be in the ghettos. You know why? Because those people, they are the ones that are looking for the justification of God. Those, you know, you have the two men that go up to the temple to pray. You have one from Mandarin and one from downtown Jacksonville. Really? 
That's what it is. You know, and what we need to do is we need to, two things. We need to make sure that we, at ourselves, we never get that proud heart. That we never get stout hearted. That we keep ourselves humble and keep the commandments of God so that we can, when we're, when we're reproved with something, we can fix it. We're humble enough to change and to repent, to change our mind, right? And in that case, it would be a change of sin also. It would bring forth a change of sin in our life. But number two, we need to realize where our focus should be. And we need to follow Christ's example. And the majority of where we go soul winning, the majority of where we spend our time is going to be in the ghettos. Now, we're going to knock these areas too. We're going to knock all the areas. Amen. You know what I mean? We're going to knock everywhere. But you know where we should spend that extra like love and care is to the poor. Amen. Follow, the, follow you know, Jesus' example. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for, uh, for giving us this church. Dear God, we thank you for your words. We thank you that you're a God that, that, uh, that brought the gospel, the good news, that it's only by believing and trusting in your name that it's easy, dear Lord, to be saved. And you did all the hard work for us. We thank you for, for uh, the abundance of scripture. We thank you, dear Lord, God, for uh, the Bible and uh, for all the examples Dear God, of, of good examples and bad examples of the Pharisees and the scribes, dear Lord, and help us to just look in the Bible and study out and find out, dear God, what you would have for us and find out, dear Lord, what, uh, you know, what, we, what we need to do in our lives to keep our lives right. Repentance uh, uh, from sin, dear Lord, uh, to help us to have a humble heart even after we have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to follow that example and not to follow the example of the Pharisees. We love you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.